welcome back to our course on Building Resilience to Compound and Cascading Disaster Risks. This is the fourth and final part of the course where you will see how to effectively implement the previous steps introduced so far. Implementation of the resilience enhancement measures identified in the previous lecture should also build on existing disaster risk reduction arrangements, but in a more adaptive manner. It requires a systemic and transformative thinking based on the concept of adaptive governance, which is more about multi-level collaboration, collective decision-making, and continuous learning for building knowledge for addressing system-wide impacts. We suggest three mutually reinforcing pillars for designing an adaptive implementation framework as follows. The first pillar is the enabling environment. It is about policies, strategies, laws, and institutional setup, which are the foundation for facilitating identified risk reduction and resilience enhancement measures. For adaptive governance, we need a flexible enabling environment to ensure multi-level coordination, meaningful participation of stakeholders, and effective decision-making resulting in gradual strengthening of institutional capacities and experiences. The second pillar is an adaptive action plan that covers the short, mid, and long-term actions. A stepwise approach of implementation is always useful for continuous learning based on the local circumstances and existing capacity. However, in the case of cascading and compound disasters, the action plan essentially should have a long-term vision and adopt a systematic approach of risk management. The third pillar is functional monitoring and evaluation processes, which are at the core of adaptive disaster risk management. It helps promote experimentation, learning, and continuous adaptation with evolving uncertainties and surprises that are common in the case of compound and cascading disasters. Let's further discuss these three pillars of the adaptive implementation framework. Pillar one, policy, legal, and institutional setup. Inadequate policies and legal arrangements can significantly affect the whole process of disaster risk management. They provide instructions on roles, responsibilities, and mandates for mobilizing different resources and capabilities during different stages of disaster management. In the context of cascading and compound disasters, policies, strategies, and legal measures have to be proactive and realistic to the changing risk profile of potential natural as well as man-made disasters. We can see that most of the countries in Asia Pacific usually have national disaster management acts or national disaster management authorities that provide guidelines and support to different aspects of disaster risk reduction to subnational and local levels. It is important that cascading and compound disaster risks are well prioritized in such acts, strategies, and guidelines. A review of existing policy and legal arrangements can help identify the key gaps and accordingly revise, update, or newly formulate acts, policies, and strategies to address cascading and compound disaster risk assessment and management. Updated legal and policy measures are critical for installing appropriate institutional arrangements that are flexible, responsive, resourceful, and with clear mandates. For example, in the Philippines in 2012, the city of Makati established the Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, the Makati Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office, and Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Committees in 12 neighborhoods. Through the city of Makati Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council and the neighborhood Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Committees, relevant laws and policies are enacted for mainstreaming disaster risk reduction at the local level. One of these policies is the Philippines Disaster Reduction and Management Act, enacted in 2010, that allocates at least 5% of the city's total revenue to local disaster risk reduction and management fund. The primary role of the institutional setups is to establish and promote a multi-level, multi-stakeholder, and multi-sector coordination mechanism down to the local level. This is crucial to manage complex types of cascading and compound disasters. In addition to that, it is also important to provide appropriate incentives to ensure a meaningful and inclusive participation of key stakeholders in the whole preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery processes of the disaster management cycle. Furthermore, institutional arrangements will be crucial for the effective mobilization of resources and capacity at different levels. Pillar two, 
Adaptive Action Plan. Establishment of necessary policies as well as legal and institutional arrangements are essential to develop a feasible action plan that will be grounded on the local reality and identified risk scenarios. The development of an adaptive action plan is a multi-stage, multi-level, and participatory process. It involves establishing a community vision and goals, setting objectives, and identifying priority areas based on the identified risk scenarios. For instance, following the Great East Japan earthquake of March 2011, the Japanese government did a simulation to assess the Nankai Trao earthquake and tsunami. The simulation found that the town of Kuroshio was under high risk of tsunami. Following that realization, the town started revising their local plan. They identified three guiding pillars or vision for revising the local plan. This involved stronger leadership of the mayor, work by the whole town so that they could mobilize 200 officials against seven staff at Kuroshio's DRR section, and residents and community effort to not give up and flee quickly to safer locations. Because of this well thought out process, encouraging, proactive, uh, encouraging a proactive approach, the town and its citizens have created an individual tsunami evacuation chart a tsunami evacuation plan for all 3,791 households, tsunami evacuation routes and shelters, and engagements in different forms of routine training. In another case, Marunda in Jakarta, Indonesia, developed a multi-stakeholder platform to address flood and other risks through a participatory approach. They established Marunda Urban Resilience in Action to carry out identified solutions during the participatory neighborhood appraisal. It is also important that communities have a complete understanding of the actions and targets to achieve objectives and realize the vision. So under each objective, communities need to explain details of all activities highlighting the state, targets, indicators, relevant priorities and outcomes. This also includes a timeline, short, medium, and long term, based on priorities, required resources, and available means of implementation. While the action plan might resemble existing disaster management plans, the details differ in terms of the objectives, priorities, linkages, and planning horizon involving systemic impacts and transformations when considering compound and cascading disasters. Pillar three, monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation are at the heart of adaptive disaster management and decision making. Monitoring and evaluation are critical to understand the risk landscape, which are always changing and evolving in the case of cascading and compound disasters. A well-functioning monitoring and evaluation allows an iterative process of self-learning and evaluating the progress, identifying gaps, and suggesting mitigation strategies. It helps detect processes and factors behind cascading and compound disasters as communities cannot understand such cause and effects in the absence of this information. The monitoring and evaluation should be objective, results-oriented, and based on performance benchmarks and indicators. In Santa Fe City, Argentina, the city focused heavily on monitoring and data collection to guide risk communication and decision making. Self-assessment tools have contributed to improving the local disaster risk management process. For monitoring, the city conducted a diagnosis for the development of its resilience strategy, which then guided the start of a new disaster risk reduction and resilience cycle based on the past experiences and learning. Since monitoring and evaluation are often resource intensive, they should be designed as a part of the learning cycle. Continuous, innovative, appropriate, and when possible, encouraging self-monitoring, reporting, and automated utilizing of information and communication technologies. That brings us to the end of this lesson where you learned how to implement the resilience strengthening measures into your community's policies and plans.